Welcome to the Self Rake Show. I'm Susan Hopkins, and I am so thrilled to be here with Joel Gunsberg for my very first interview as part of this this series. Stuart has been bugging me <laughs> to start getting some self raggers uh, infused into our talks, and you're our very first. So welcome, welcome. Oh, that's exciting. First one. <laughs> I'm really I'm excited. A bit nervous, you know. This podcasting is fairly new to me, but uh, right. All right. I'm sure that we're going to have some really interesting conversations today. So before we get started, can you tell folks a little bit about who you are? They may already have picked up your accent. Sounded a little funny. <laughs> I know. you. Right. <laughs> well, I'm Joel Gunsberg. I grew up just outside of Washington, D.C. in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland. i uh, been here nearly my whole life with a, cu- a couple of times uh, moving within the state. Uh, Graduated from social work school in 2000 and um, went to University of Maryland um, and then f- graduated with a, a master's in social work. And then from there, I was immediately into schools. So I, um, my first or actually my second internship was working with a company called the Family Support Center. And we had a uh, contract with Montgomery County Public Schools which is a, a small suburb just outside of Washington, D.C. Um, well, Montgomery County is a pretty big county, but it's just outside of Washington, D.C. And um, I worked with the alternative school system there. And that was, we didn't have social workers in the county at that point out, outside of certain um, level five schools. So we had a contract where we were working with students who had been put out of schools for behavior or attendance. And my original job was working in a, in a middle school. And then um, once I finished my internship, stayed with that company with, for quite some time and uh, worked in the alternative school system, supervised other social workers in the, in the alternative system. And one of the things that we did at that uh, nonprofit was we also not only worked with the county, but I also we had contracts with independent schools throughout the Washington, D.C. area. And we did lots of social skills training talks about drugs and alcohol and the impact of all kinds of different things that were going on. So I got a lot of uh, time with independent schools and private schools in the DC area. And one of those schools I actually contracted with was the British International School of Washington and eventually left my nonprofit job to take a counseling role at the British school and was there for 12 years. And then (laughs) from there, uh, after being at British school for 12 years, uh, it was pretty interesting story. I, I was trying to implement a mindfulness program at the British school. So I was a counselor for the whole school, pre-K through 12th grade, uh, which was quite a big job. We had hundreds of students and to be the only counselor is, is a very big job, along with working with the learning support team. <clears throat> I was implementing a social emotional learning uh, program for the our lower school. And as we were getting accredited and seeing how we would put stuff in with the inter- international primary curriculum. Um, I was adding some of those social emotional learning lessons that would kind of supple- supplement lessons. And in that found mindfulness and thought I would find a way to implement it into the school. And this, this is a funny part of the story of how I even get, got to where I'm at now. I, I ended up doing a mindful, an eight-week mindfulness-based stress reduction course at Georgetown University, and I was, you know, talking about who I was, that I was looking to launch this for schools, and the and the guy who ran the program, his name was Paul Jones. He he told me at the very first thing, you know, that it's really noble that you want to bring something into a school, but mindfulness will never work unless you make this about you, and did that. Um, and kind of was like, okay, got it. Still going to just learn what I need to learn and move forward. And it was session two that I kept telling, they were doing this uh, body scan. And, and as we were doing it, I kept falling asleep. And I said to the guy, I said, Paul, I don't understand what I'm supposed to do. This isn't working. All I do is fall asleep. He said, well, I'll tell you, Joel, you're tired. Right. And, and that became a theme. I'm doing too much. It's it's this is overloaded and and I love the school that I worked at but it was I was putting in a lot of time and a lot of of effort and what came of that course 
was I, I built a, a personal mindfulness practice. And this is probably 2018 that this was all going on and ended up getting introduced to a school called Sandy Spring Friends School, which is close to my house. Um, and my brother went to school here and I interviewed here and it, it was a really nice fit. They have something called a meeting for worship here. So students, um, you know, once a week we'll do 30 minutes of silence. And when that came open, I thought, wow, that's kind of a cool place to implement a social emotional learning program, but also infuse the mindfulness with it. Uh, interviewed for the job, didn't know that I'd really take it. And it was perfect. Like it's the perfect fit for, for all that I've done. And I've been here now, this wrapping up tomorrow, our last is our last day of school. And I'll have been here for four years. And uh, it's a Quaker, a small Quaker school uh, just outside of D.C., probably 15, 60 miles from D.C. And um, I work, I went from being a pre-K through 12th grade to just focusing on lower school here at the school um, and started a uh, social emotional learning uh, class here called Shine. And that is pre-K through fifth grade. Uh, students will meet with, I'll teach the class once a week, anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes per per gray group. So it, it's fascinating when you ask somebody to tell you their story, because we, we know each other a bit. We, you know, yeah, we're, yeah, yeah. we're meeting in person soon when you come up up here for the summer symposium in July. Uh, but, but we've gotten on Zoom, I don't know, half a dozen times or so. Right. <laughs> you just said so many things. I had, I had no idea about you. So I got to ask a couple of questions just sure. to keep going. First of all, when you say a level five school, what does that mean? for those of us that don't know the lingo. Yeah, so students who have severe emotional disability to the point where they need to have special services. So, and it's a school that's based just for those needs to be served. So, so like the clinical social workers in this area would be there to support therapeutic services and making sure, you know, that they're on site to, to help support the learning throughout the day. And so when you were in the alternative school in the beginning, that was uh, like a high school? Or it was all well, yeah, no, it was middle school, and and that was th those schools were not those were l actually lower level than lower five schools. Those were much more just consistent and persistent behaviors that you would see from students. So I I did mostly middle school, but supervised some of our people in our high schools as well. So my next thing is we have a link. I I taught at a British international school too you yeah, know yeah. that from taking our courses i might have mentioned it but the school i taught in italy was a british international school so that was kind of a neat thing i, I knew you had worked in another and in, in a number of different places uh, along your journey so another link that we have but i want yeah. to end on the final one how cool was that that the the person teaching the mindfulness uh, program. I mean, mindfulness. We have uh, Stuart. We'll we'll put a link to it in 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 uh, uh, in the notes to that go with this. But he has blogs on mindfulness, and like mindfulness yeah. is one of those that you put out there, and everybody thinks they know what you mean. And there's all sorts of different understandings right. of it, right? And yep. uh, um, so, but one of the things that I thought was really neat is when he just told you, Joel, you're tired. That's <laughs> that's actually a very self rig thing to realize. It is. Not to it, is. it is. You know, it's so funny because the more we talk, the more it will lay out why self reg landed so well for me. Yeah. Uh, and you know, like I even say, um, I didn't even talk much about my private practice. I opened up a private practice and working as a clinical social worker um, a long, long time ago, and that's kind of worked in conjunction with my school time. I do some time where I. I I meet with clients after I'm done with school hours. And, you know, one of the people in my, well, actually two of the colleagues who work with me at, at, at my office, they, uh, they were doing, they did the same mindfulness course probably a year before and they did it together kind of like, well, we'll do it. And I was like, well, good for you. Maybe you can bring some mindfulness to the practice. Well, Joel, do you want to join it? I'm like, ah, no way. That's not for me. You know, like the, the whole concept of, telling someone just get to come. It's all good. I felt sometimes was a little bit, um, oh, there was a, there's a great article and I can send you the link to it where it talks about how yoga and mindfulness and practices that, you know, like that can often be weaponized. And, and I tended to fall in that 
nobody's going to tell me that I'm going to be happy by just being calm because I like to move fast. I like to stay busy. And yet it wasn't for me, but I never expected when I enrolled to the course that it would be something that would support me. But that whole world changed after, after that course. Yeah. It, it even is relevant today. Like we, you know, we have that saying, lend, lend our calm and, and calm is a really important thing, but it's not a choice. It's, it's a state, right? It's, Stuart right. Thomas, but it is homeostatic, homeostatic balance. And it doesn't solve everything. There's a whole lot, whole lot more than that. I'm high energy like you. And if somebody tries to get me to go sit down or take a few deep breaths, or, <laughs> I'm like, I, I, I do yoga, but it's like, Heart, it's heavy duty, duty yoga because that's how I find my calm, right? So yep. you know, <laughs> so there's something to all of this for sure. The, the for sure, but it's like trying to help it make sense for for what we need and and, and our work with kids. So my question for you is, I'm going to ask you how you found your way to self reg, which you've sort of started to tell us a little bit. But yeah. I'm particularly yeah. curious now that you've added into it, okay, the, the social emotional learning, which is still a big part of your work. The mindfulness, which I think is still a big part of your work. Yeah. And and yet you found your way somehow. I don't know how you actually found us. I remember where I first met you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can tell you. So this is kind of the, the big, I give you the or the origin story. And there's probably an origin story of as to why I'm in. So I got into social work in the first place, which may or may not come up. And, and But um, so we get the we get going into the mindfulness stuff. Um, I get the job here at Sandy Spring Friends School. I was working with a company called Mindful Schools, who has a wonderful curriculum on how to bring mindfulness into schools in a really thoughtful um, and I think equitable way and pays a lot of homage to the, the concepts that you know, that mindfulness isn't for everyone. And, you know, I'll give you a perfect example. Like their, they, their work in a lot of their curriculum, you would go into, okay, now close your eyes. But if you don't feel comfortable closing your eyes, you may want to look at the ground because it, you know, from a trauma informed type of practice, closing eyes might, might be really triggering for some people. So to be able to name that, I really appreciated the mindful schools work. And when thinking about mindfulness and you, you think about, okay, this is what mindfulness actually is. I start thinking about mindful communication and, you know, depth of thinking. So I start bringing everything in. So f- my first year here at Sandy Spring Friends School was 2019, 2020 school year. So 2019, I'm writing all these great pieces for the curriculum, pulling things from, you know, uh, Project Zero, uh, you know, mindful of uh, the, the um, thinking routines. I'm pulling in stuff from different um, curriculums that I've used over the years. I'm, I'm, on fire, loving every minute of it. And things are going well. The mindfulness stuff is landing really well. I'm in the middle of a year long course um, with mindful schools. I'm feeling good about everything. And then March, 2020, the world changes, right? So COVID hits. Um, There's so much that's happening. And to readjust to what are you going to do and how are you going to readjust to be on Zoom and what's going on with these kids? What's going on with these families? Is everybody okay? The depths of what what was needed for me as a therapist in my private practice seem to be clearer, you know, with, with how do you move to a virtual platform, but how do you be a school counselor in the midst of kids being on school online? It was in it was something that I, I, I mean, you talk about a tidal wave and, and people coming to you for answers. What became really important was slow down, have conversations, get to know people, get to know what's best, uh, finish the year long course with mindful schools. And it became like an overwhelming search of what's the best trauma informed practice. So I was looking at everything. I had already started the social emotional learning classes, you know, like in the, in the courses long before this. Um, So I knew that would be part of where I would land and what was best for kids to continue to address their emotional state and help with families with that. Um, Somewhere along the line, we ended up getting um, a new uh, lower school head here at the school and her name was Sarah Barton Thomas. She asked me, hey, Joel, have you heard of Stuart Shanker? 
And I was like, I feel like the name is familiar, but I had not read Self Reg. So Sarah turns me on to the book. And and if I know somebody has a good idea of things, like I'll just open the phone and order the book. Yeah. Order the book. Um order the audio book so because I can take notes with the handwritten, but also and I blew through the audio. It was where's this bit? Like this seems like second nature. Within a couple of days, I mean, I made that decision really quickly because it was in the summer that we had that conversation. And I was like, what do you think of this foundations course? Do you know anybody who's taken it? And and it was, I had read the book. Everything seemed, seemed to make sense. I was reading some of the the, the many things um, on the website. There's so much depth of information on the website. I was really impressed and was thinking, okay, this seems perfect for giving people a framework of understanding stress and a framework of intervening with stress that allows for individual practice and, and honors individual understanding, honors individuals' lives, everything. And I, I was, it can't be that good, is it? And then I was like, well, what about this foundations course? Sarah's like, I don't know, give it a shot, see what's up. And, and I had some money in the bank and was like, I'm going to do it and funded it myself and just did it. And my life is completely different professionally and personally after, after it's been one of the, like, I want to say it was probably a month or two into the foundations course was like, this stuff has been on my head forever. Like, this is the way I do my calculations and equations on how to support people in my private practice or in counseling. But you all have given words to it and you've got lots of infographics and like, and thank you world, because <laughs> here was everything that I needed to know. If we're going to start with trauma informed practice, this is the way to begin. And and that just has blown up since. But it's that was how I got to self reg So again, so much in there. For the folks listening that may be wondering, okay, but what are you actually talking about? How do you describe self-reg? And this isn't, I'm not putting you on the spot. No, I love it. I can do it. Explain it. And, and, and then I want to tap in a little bit to you said how it's really affected you personally and professionally and just hear, yep. hear what more you might, might want to share about that. So I just, des- I describe it, um, and a lot of it uses some of the same analogies that you guys use, but I I, um, I try to describe it. I give the description of the five domains of stress. You know, I, I will give good examples. I hyper-focus when I talk about the biological side. Um, and for anybody who's heard this before, I go on and on about, if I have chap lips, stay away from me. Like, I, I am not listening to you. I shouldn't be at work. Shouldn't be doing any. I mean, I am the worst. I get chap lips. I'm thinking, and I should be a, a, a commercial for a chapstick. They have this medicated chapstick, and it's medicated by chapstick, the company. If that light blue one, if it's not there, I start to get all kinds of anxiety. I'm thinking, don't lick your lips, lick your lips, don't lick your lips. Oh, but they're dry. You know, like it's, I, it's, there's no way that I can think. So when I explain that, I talk about the biological stressor of just having chapped lips or, you know, that I lost the time of having bad hair days a long time ago, but that can be really stressful, you know, whatever it might be. I, I dial in on that and then I go through all the five domains and then say, okay, now picture this. And and I know whoever's listening, you know, we're, we're talking about an international um, community. So some people might use Celsius, but I use Fahrenheit. So I always say 72 degrees is like the perfect. You, you set the 71, 72 degrees in the house. That's the perfect temperature for me. I can have my shoes off, bare feet, walk around in shorts, and I'm fine. You start going 73, 74, I start to sweat a little bit, and that's happening. I'm in probably 73 degrees right now. Sweat a little bit. You go over 74, 75, I start getting grumpy. You know that it it I need to bring the the heat down. And if we go a little bit colder than 69, then I'm putting on a sweatshirt. You know, like the hoodie might go up and that's how, so what I do to regulate that temperature myself, that's how I, I describe each of these five domains that we're constantly in this battle to get to homeostasis on each of those things. And when one thing is off, it can throw everything else off. 
I was using that for a while and, and hearing you guys, I'm doing the, um, the, uh, presenters course or the, the facilitators course right now. And the dimmer switch is so good. The, the concept of using that analogy of like, okay, if I'm drawing, I have to have a specific lighting that when I'm drawing, but if I'm taking a picture, I need a different light. Or if I'm going to bed, I, I am like obsessive about having dimmer switches in my house. I have a friend who's an electrician yeah. who always seems like, you have to have a dimmer switch in every room. Yes. Yes, for sure. I do. Absolutely. Oh, that's so, so I think that any of those, just understanding that it's never perfect. Doesn't matter what's happening in life. You're never going to get to 72 degrees forever. It's just going to be, you get through these moments and it's a constant kind of just trying to get to balance. Well, it makes me laugh that, you know, you talking about temperature. So it, it's a great example, but it also allows me to talk about individual differences. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm in my 50s. <laughs> yeah. I keep it at, I, I, you know, it's Celsius in Canada, but we kind of use both, to be honest with you. So uh, they, oh, it, you can tell somebody's age when they can tell you in Fahrenheit, but it's 66. <laughs> yeah. My whole, my family is like, you're freezing me out, but it's like, yeah, yeah or I can't sleep at night, you know, so it's really... Uh, uh, I don't know. It's just really thinking about di- about the different things that dysregulate us. And while some people might be hearing the chopstick example, it, it, there are things that just it it can throw you off so much. I, I sometimes right. in workshops do the pebble in the shoe, uh, in in the shoe moment. You know what happens yeah. when you know what was that day that it was just like you had a pebble in your shoe. It was just like yeah. everything was off, and you're and you think it doesn't affect everything else, and it does, right? I mean, it's yeah. it's not so simple as just that one thing, but beginning to think about stress like that, uh, you know, it really can be quite a game changer, right? Yeah, no, and it's interesting too because if you think about how it goes into practice, like I I think about there's a third grade class in particular that I work with that um, we the teacher and I have done a number of like we're, let's try it out with this group, let's try this out, and you know. I, we um we were talking about i created these um stress monitor like mammometers it's like almost like a, a thermometer but it's blank and the kids can kind of write in with an expo marker they can write where their temperature is and and with that the, we have to explain each of the domains yeah and one of the things that came up in this one group was we were talking about cognitive overload and they had just been talking about spelling tests. And when we were talking about tests, there's two or three kids who are really good spellers. They love to be tests because they get great reward. Then you start talking to the the kids who are feeling stress about even being tested because they might not do well. They don't like the, the pressure of it, that it was And we were just talking about how you name it's not we don't even use the word spelling test, but just the 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 way of assessing the spelling was causing a a massive amount of stress and that that cognitive load could be there. And then we start talking about math and then you've got the two students who were doing well with their their spelling start saying, yeah, no, when it's math time, that's when I start to get the stress. So the individual difference in the classroom when you start talking about the domains and to be able to, like, I, I know in that class in particular, that conversation led to them reading a book where they're sharing, you know, there were some students who were sharing some of their learning differences with the rest of the group, what it's like to have ADHD or what it's like to, ha- to have dyslexia. It's, and, and especially when it comes to reading, like what might come naturally as somebody is excited about their reading, that somebody else in the classroom might not be that excited about when we break out the book. And when we, you know, one of the things that's different about self-reg from a, a lot, most all, <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty biased. I moved across Canada just to, to, to run the organization here with Stuart. So that's how, how convinced I am, but it, it allows us to work on different things. It's not like you have all the answers. It's not a program. There's not a bunch, you know, the strategies in a bucket, but if you're, you know, if we're realizing that it truly is overload for the cognitive um, we work on dialing, there's other things you do, but you're working on dialing down that load versus saying, okay, here, here's a strategy. Here's what you need to do to manage your, you know, your stuff or, or yourself or, um, it, it's, it's not, it, it, all of those involve that very much that thinking brain. Well, what happens when that, when that goes out the window, we've all had moments like, cl- I think it's cloud, cloud steel. He did a, a book called stereo, uh, did a lot of work in the, in the area of stereotype threat. 
And it really fascinating because, and if I've said, if I've, if I've credited the wrong person, you just spark me remembering it, but somebody uh, correct us in, in the notes, but he, he, he did um, um, studies like research where he would just trigger an identity, right? Mm. So one of his was around um, math and it was with uh, male and female, I think young adults, I think it was, I'm sure it's probably university students. That's, that's who a lot of these studies are done with, you know, who's in front of you with the researchers. And they triggered the identity um, of, of male, female, and triggered the identity of, of Asian was one, for example. And just by triggering the identity, by simply making you have to check, check off a box on, on mm. a test or something, that that people did less well than they did in other like really how does that happen is it that they need to try harder yeah and and it's it can be really about all of these things that it's really affecting um the space in the brain to show what you know like we've all had moments when we like we knew it we yep. do it <laughs> yep. right no i i've had deep conversations our head of school rodney glasgow is one of my favorite humans on the planet he he talks about the amygdala and and the way he defines it is um, that the amygdala is kind of like a spiritual part of like it, it's kind of sensing the spiritual right because we're always sensing for comfort and wow I was like <laughs> I've never thought of yeah. that a, tell me like, more tell me more what he means yeah. by that well so like you you walk in a room your brain is scanning for safety and comfort yeah. or yeah. or yeah. danger yeah. at and when when comfort finds comfort it's 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 amazing right like and you think about like um and not, and not to say that i am uh, a quaker but working in a quaker school one of the one of the um uh the things that we talk about is find the light in everyone right that every child or every person that we come in contact with has this light within them, right? That we're getting, and that's the the class shine that I call the shine class. That's where that came from. It's not an acronym. It's the classes to help that light shine, like that every individual needs to be their best individual. So I came up with that name to kind of accentuate that point. But if you think about it and you you walk in, if somebody doesn't have a sense of belonging, if somebody's not safe, you may not catch that light or, you know, the amygdala safety, like just it's... um. I think that connection and not that we're, I mean, spirituality is a deep, deep conversation, but you know, when you think that you're truly connected and you have true deep belonging, there is something special about that. That is a special thing that opens up so many different doors for us. I mean, that's not just calm. That's like warmth and, and depth of connection to life. I think it's, um, you know, I think that when we walk in and you think about, something that thinks about amygdala and how do we bring to safety and you think about things of belonging you know when we talk about this campus here and i talk about rodney um we have a a a real deep care and concern for diversity equity inclusion work and belonging at this school um and and not just in our school how do we bring it to our lives like there when you think about all the different identities and all the different things that can happen and how you step into a room, you know, I know for me, there's going to be certain privileges that I might feel based on the identity that I, I have no control over. I walk into a room. This is the uniform that I have. White male walks into a room. That's going to bring in feelings for different people in different ways, whether that be safety or whether that be discomfort. And till somebody gets to know who I am in the depths to me, there, there may be trust, there may not be, there's, there's lots to that. But I also think when you start talking about identities, that safety conversation changes with the identities in the room as you're having that conversation as well. So, it, and, and is it, is it a safe room that just to have the conversation might not be safe or might bring up different feelings for different people based on their comfort. So I think this is where, you know, when you think about self-reg and how it relates to so many things, I think this is one in particular, how one gets ready for a meeting, you know, that we're going to have a meeting. And if you're in a school that has diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, how I get ready for that meeting may be completely different for a person of color who, and now we're talking about that particular identity and who's having that conversation, who's delivering the training and what that might feel like to be that person that is going to bring up different feelings for everybody. And, and I think that's where 
you know, you, you think about social or pro-social, you know, all these different stressors as you're coming in and having that awareness is, um, this is where, I mean, when you think about how I've grown professionally, this is where the self-reg stuff goes, okay, this doesn't feel, this doesn't feel right. Now, is this the intervention, you know, you get to those, this is where the other part where I would, how I would explain self-reg too, is the, it's, you've got the framework of understanding the domains and that's the framework of understanding stress, but what's the framework of intervention? And that's where the five R's come in, you know, yeah. how am I reframing what's happening in this moment right now? Is this, does this need to be stated overtly, you know, and, and, I don't know if you've ever heard this saying, but this has been something that I've stuck to and probably will come up with different ways to make this a bigger thing. But like, how do you make the covert over that this is being stated? Is this, am I the person who needs to state it right now? Or is this going to come off wrong if it comes from me? And if it's not coming from me, how do we revisit this later? I think that can all be part of the reframe. But then, then when you look at, okay, now I'm recognizing the stressors. How am I recognizing the stressors for me? How am I recognizing the stressors for others? And like we were joking right before we got on to this, you know, there's the infographic with the, the iceberg and you've got, you know, the carrot boat and you got the submarine leading the iceberg. Yeah. I need to be on that submarine and leave the carrot boat on the dock right? Like, how, like, I really need to be recognizing the stresses and how deep this goes for the people. And, and if I'm a good detective of that, yeah. then I can probably have some really good communication. And, and, and then, you know, okay, what am I doing to reduce those stressors? Is it going to cause more stress for me to reduce this intervention? Or am I going to go on with it? And then reflecting, is this the right thing? After I did it, is it the right thing? And then the restoration piece, I think that has so many different levels depending on what, what it is we're trying to restore. So there's like, we need more. We, we definitely need more podcasts. I mean, I could go so, so many directions with all right, of Right, right. The infographic that Joel is referring to, we'll link that as well. That's a Kirsten Weens graphic. And it's one of those, uh, you know, the behavior is the tip of the iceberg. Um, but but she's done it in a self reg way, which is basically the the five domains are are, are beneath the water uh, for those of you just listening. And then there's a little little boat up top with a carrot. So the idea that we do all these behavior sort of approaches, um, you know, the carrot and stick, trying to get good behavior. Meanwhile, there's there's so much we're missing beneath. But what yeah. I love about what you just shared, Joel, is that you're um, so to me it's the science. You reminded me of, of uh, Susie Cominchin from Manitoba. Uh, she works with Manitoba First Nations, the uh, Education Resource Center there, and she she's done talks. She she does all sorts of stuff with us, but she always uh, talks about how uh, children, uh, our children are our sacred, you know, our, our sacred responsibility. You know, it reminded me a little bit of that about that spiritual side when you're seeing mm. um, seeing seeing that. But you've also just sort of taken us to a next level, and, and we need that. We really do, and we need to really believe and see differently. But you're taking it to the next level and saying it's not just a nice idea. It's not just rights of a child. Um, it's not just the, the human, you know, the human state and the human condition. It's what do I do? Right? Yeah. So it, there's and, – and it's like a dynamic. You're descri describing a bit of a dance. You're trying to figure things out. You're looking at the mm. stressors you can reduce. You're trying to understand the – you know, the various elements of self-reg and, and, and figuring out your, your ways um, to help a child or a group of children or, you know, your team. So you want to just talk a little bit about, about that. And, and so, yeah, you know, the idea of cause people always ask when they're new to, to self-reg, they're always like, can you show me the strategy? And, and I, I, yeah. I'm respectful <laughs> of that. I really, you know, it's, it, but as soon as I hear that, I will often under ask how they define self self-regulation or self-reg. Um, just because there's different definitions and you got to be talking brain body self-regulation or we're talking about, we're talking about try harder compliance, all those sorts of things that work until they don't. Right. Um, yeah. But oftentimes people are looking for strategies and there's lots of strategies, Yeah. Um, but it's not as simple as, you know, as, as a simple strategy. It's, a, it's, it's really more about our relationships and within. So do you have any ideas that you might share with people that are saying, okay, but just give me something yeah. and I can, <laughs> I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta, I gotta apply it right now. Like, yeah. go ahead, like fix my family, fix my, my relationships with my, my students. I mean, there's so much to it. It's, um, you know, 
I think I was probably, and, and if a parent from my school listens to this, they'll probably laugh when I say, because I was the, just give everybody some grace, you know, give yourself some grace. Like that was, that was my, my line. And it, I know that even looking at, you know, when you look at how people review things, that that was something that came up. This is not a Joel says we should have some grace moment, <laughs> you know, but I do think the the, the key tenet in mindfulness, and this is why I, you know, like with Kabat-Zinn's, um, John Kabat-Zinn's um, definition of mindfulness is we're focusing on what happens now, my, you know, on purpose and what, what are we thinking, feeling now, but we're meeting with non-judgment. Right. And I think that becomes one of the key points of like, if I'm really truly being a detective and understanding, okay, using you all the the line of of what your company talks about and what Stuart talks about is you know you know see a child differently see and then you'll see a different child i think that it's it's been one of the best things ever especially if i talk about my work with parents that you you have to recognize that this is a this is a dance that's going on day after day after day after day and you know you got through you know, the dance from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. to get them out the door. You're going to have another dance whenever it is that you pick them up, mm-hmm. right? And then when you get that dance, you're going to have the dance for food. And then you're going to have the dance for bed. And then you're going to have the dance for when they get out of bed. And they go through the night. And then you have to do your own stuff. Like, there's there's so much with that that you're going to be imperfect. So give yourself a break. Start with that. But if you think about me stating out loud that 95 percent of the fights that i have with my two sons i have one who's 10 and the other one's 12 that almost all of our arguments have to do with speed and power right like i told you we have to go we have to go now like can we do this we've got to go we've got we're going to be late basketball practice doesn't matter insert activity here we're late we got to go my stress level about being late is my stress level. They forgot their water bottle. They didn't do this. I've got one that usually is telling the other one what to do. And then I'm telling him, don't do that. Don't boss him around. So it's, it's this constant struggle. And I say like, if, if we can give ourselves a moment to understand, okay, what is that about? If I break that down within the, the dynamic of the five domains, what's my stress level? Well, I'm a bad father if they don't listen to me. No, I know. You know, like <laughs> that's the that's the, the you know the baseline of I don't believe that, but that's what my brain is. Okay, you shouldn't, you should, you should be able to say what you say, and they should listen. You know, okay, that's not accurate, but I can go back and go, okay, what can I do better to support that morning routine? And then you go back, and then you try to do it better the next time, and and. F- I, I use that because the work that I've done with parents, we can increase the, lo- the list of what goes on in each family of here's where you can have some success. How do you set yourself? And I am not the most organized human being in the world. So sometimes I woke up and I was thinking about something else or I'm checking an email on my phone. So my stress level has nothing to do with them. They were doing something else because I was busy looking at my phone. So maybe I need to put the phone aside. Just do the detective work. What can shift? How can you do better in those moments? Um, And is it a moment of understanding that, okay, this one's level of executive function makes me really frustrated. They forget everything. I should, they should be better at that. They should... But that might be something else and that you have to recognize that child needs five prompts. They're not hearing you until prompt four. So when you yell at prompt five, they don't know why you're yelling at them. They're mad at you for yelling at them. So recognize that everything's going to take five, six prompts. Even point out, I'm at prompt five. Okay. And what works for which family? I think it just... You, you're you're helping to do that. I think that's one piece that I would say about family work. Um, and then I think with teachers, 
you know, we have this high level of wanting to bring the best out of our people. And if they don't follow rules, we are supposed to get them to follow rules, which causes massive relational issues with power dynamic, you know, that you, you can look at any study. I don't care where you, you type it in a, in a search relationships and grades and, and that you'll see, you know, higher, better results for anybody who's got a better relationship with their teacher. That's, you know, I, I'm sure that you could probably refute some of it, but I could probably bring hundreds of studies before you to say, yep, but, but this, but this, but this, but this. So how do you, how do you build on that? Well, if you have the relationship, you can probably talk about the behavior it, and then you can talk about what's the struggle and maybe the struggle is something at home. Maybe the struggle is something in the classroom. Maybe the struggles in your tone of voice, maybe the struggle is in the way your classroom is set up and that there is a certain noise. I, I was listening to something in um, the facilitators course where somebody had written in their um in their thing that there was uh, a noise that was coming from a clock and when it got fixed that the kids actually cheered the next day that somebody actually paid attention it was not you know like wow. there, there's that little thing you know we just have to focus and pay attention and if we look at the 360 we might be able to add that little change and then and then did it work i mean i think that's where the reflect part of the five r's is really important and i i think this is you know, the, the meeting with non-judgment and the, I, the meld of, and I would love to have a deeper conversation about mindfulness and how it relates to self-reg and that self-reg is basically mindfulness. Yeah. It's another way of saying this is mindfulness, but just a, a, a different map yeah. of, of what to do. That's what it feels like for me. And we can have another podcast. So that's really, cause it, it really helps me stay in the present and that's my form of mindfulness. Yep. Uh, you know that really, okay, I'm here and now and, yep. and practice awe and all those kinds of things, right? So I, I love what you just shared. So, you know, one of the things about being a parent, uh, if it helps everybody out there, I mean, this is what I do full time for for a career. I've written, you know, and I yeah. just before we got online, I was late getting on with Joel because my kid <laughs> who's 15, <laughs> who's in school, by the way, uh, uh, apparently took my cord for my good computer, you know, and everybody can probably relate or most of you can relate to some version of that where you're looking for something and, and your, your child has taken it and you instantly, like you honestly feel your heart rate go up. You, you would see it go up. Right. But, yeah. and, 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 you know, is it my best self rape parenting moment? Probably not. Right. Cause I'm, I'm feeling late and guilty and all of these sorts of things. Right. So I love that you added, um, this idea of grace, because I do think it's really important um, with ourselves. Like that's one thing that self reg has gifted me. It's actually helped me look back on my teenage years, which were not very good, <laughs> yep. with, with with more compassion. So that grace is an important piece. But you're also not saying no boundaries. Boundaries are important. They create super safety. important. Because I think yeah. if, if you get to, if you get to the question, which I think is one of my favorite questions. I mean, like I. I I would probably say what make you say that was one of my favorite questions mm -hmm. on the planet, but the, why am I seeing this behavior and why now yeah. those questions yeah. help me so much. Like if you think about the, um, the stress level of, of a student and a teacher, yeah. why am I seeing this behavior and why now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if I ask a question, I could go into one of my social emotional learning lines, and this would be something if somebody's looking for a nugget of like, take this, bring it back to your classroom. I ask a question sometimes like, who here got in an argument before they, they got, they came into school today. And there's usually a few people depending on the day, but sometimes it might even be half the room raises their hand. They got in an argument before they even got to school. So somebody's gotten ramped up to a place where they then are coming down. That's what's the story behind that. And then what's waiting for them when they get home. So like if that argument happened, is it still going to be happening when they get home? And does every moment of that day have some sort of impact on what's coming? You know, like, is it going to be like, oh, you better have a good day at school today. And then, Every interaction is, a, I better stay on my, oh, I messed up. I can't, you know, like they start to let them go into a flow state of, 
hanging out with their friends. And uh oh, you know, the, you, again, that story could be a million different stories of what happened, what's coming, what's happened, is it over? Then the other question is, who here is tired? You know, who here got good sleep last night? I can I can say there was a day in particular, I asked my third, my fourth, my fifth grade students that, and over 50% of the room raised their hand every single time. That's a problem. Like we've got tired kids in a room. What does that mean when you're tired? Yeah. So why am I seeing this behavior? Why now? Why are they grumpy? Well, maybe they're just ready to eat or maybe they're tired. Maybe they're just done learning. It, it, there could be, a, and not to say that, and this goes to your point of like, does that mean there's no discipline? No. What it means is what can we do to support that person to get better sleep or, you know, do they need to talk to a counselor about what happened at home before they go back to their class? Yeah. To then go back, get them back online to, to learning. Cause that's what we're here for. Like at the end of the day, my job isn't just to be, Oh, every, counselor makes everybody happy. My job here is to make sure that people get back to class and do the best with their learning. So that that becomes the, well, let's get back to our discipline here, y'all, that we need to be students, we need to learn and do the best that we can as humans with that. And as educators, we can sometimes, we actually shut down trying, uh, you know, we do it because of our own stress, but we, we can do that sometimes when we're like, oh, he didn't get any sleep last night, he was up on his you know, whatever tablet all night long and you feel yeah. frustrated with the family and yeah, I get it. <laughs> but that kid is also in front of you. And and it's interesting. We don't realize that, that, that puts up a wall. I mean, you talked about the amygdala and, and, uh, and, you know, being that spiritual, that, that chance to connect it, 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 it the kids are reading that, right? So, yeah. Or we get really stuck on the, the, the idea of, well, the trigger is he took his pencil or he didn't want that. They didn't want that we were coming inside yeah. and, and it's like, but why is the trigger the trigger? And what you're saying is there's always more to understand. And we're not trying to take bubble wrap or take away all the stress. Right. It, it's what, what are the things we can remove? I always think one thing that, that can help is, you know, we've got lots of kids. If you're, you know, a teacher and you've got all kinds of kids, it's like, I can't be, you know, I'm not a counselor for every kid. Yeah, no, and, and you're not. That's right. But, and yet, what can we do for the whole group? We look you know, we, in, we talk about, you know, I can change the weather. If I'm trying yeah. to teach something or I'm trying to do something and I've lost everybody, what do I do in that moment? Right. What do yeah. I get people to move or whatever? Or if you see a kid walk in the door, you don't have to know everybody's life story. Um, but you, you already sense it's going to be a day. Trust that that's actually your, your brain body. It's your nervous system picking something up. What do you do in that moment? And you're like, I don't have more time. Yeah, but it's going to be yeah. a whole lot more time in three hours. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah well, and I build deep relationships with with the with the teachers that I work with in schools. I know being a counselor can sometimes be, you know, you're in a different role, but yeah. I love the teachers I work with. I mean, they're amazing human beings. And then you start thinking about this amazing human being is trying to help all these other amazing human, and they have a lot of the same philosophy. It is I've worked at a lot of schools and a lot of schools where I've worked, a lot of people I've worked with are, are children first and what I would call children first people, you know, yeah, yeah. I don't care if you're my best friend, if, if it means that you've done something to harm a child, we're going to work together to make sure that that doesn't happen. Right. Like that. We always want the kids to get the best that they can get. So you have all these kid first people working together and then you have someone who might not be succeeding that can be super frustrating yeah. for a teacher. Like why can I get this person to get where I need them to get? You got teachers who then get dysregulated themselves because they're going home. But when I gave the point of, you know, I'm a bad father. I didn't do get them to, t I'm a bad teacher. I go home, you know, like not me personally, but if a st teacher goes home, they're not getting the result they need. I'm a bad teacher. I should have done this. My planning was poor. I could have done this. I could have delivered this. I'm putting much more time into this student and I'm letting this student, you know, kind of, and, and it becomes the, the almost overwhelming sense of I am now causing harm instead of, yeah. And that's that moment of, okay, let's pause. This is a long, long slog. Yeah. And if they're not getting here, what can we do? What can we do for this moment for you? What can we do for this moment for the student? And what then past this moment, and this is where I would steal from Brene Brown and some of the, what can I do in the next, 
you know, 30 seconds. What could I do in the next three days? What can I do in the next three weeks? What, you know, just extend, you know, just keep extending to long, short to long and, and, and really mapping that out. You know, the student might need this. I might need learning support to step in and, and support with this part of the reading. I might need family to get outside resource. I may need to talk to the therapist or can I have the counselor talk to the therapist? Cause their frustration tolerance is a little bit low right now. I, I'm really mm-hmm. glad you responded like that because I, I should put out there, I see myself as a teacher first and yeah. I'm by no means, uh, and I actually think the teachers are our heroes of of the biggest heroes of right now. Uh, Absolutely. The stress and what's on everyone's shoulders and, um, you know, and it's hard when you have some, we, I mean, we're dealing with some difficult behaviors and, 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 you know, one of the stressors that can be one of the, the toughest and we're rounding out and I want to um, um, use this to segue into uh, one last thing, which is to ask you about a very special blog that was really kind of game changing for me. But one of the heaviest stressors on, on, on us, especially people who've don't given their lives to don't, you know, to, to taking care of others. Yeah. Uh, right. Which is anybody in educators, social workers, counselors, they are healthcare professionals, grandparents people you know all that we're really working to help help kids is we we take on the stress of others right yeah that's a heavy duty one on us like sometimes we will have all this patience all day long you know but we yeah handling all these other kids and then we go home and we're snappy at our own kids or our partner or whatever you know because it is a heavy duty stress and the pro-social of not being able to get to every kid yeah the, i find the people that are real relationship builders it can be very stressful when there's that that kid we don't realize that's what it is yeah but we're good at we've connected with everybody but i can't connect with that kid and it's not about the educator uh, it does. We do need the the compassion is what allows us to keep trying to find a way forward. But yeah. that can be stressful because it's it 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 just it, it feels really uncomfortable. Or anybody that that notices when they see someone struggling and they're like, oh, oh. you know, all right. of those are pro social stressors, and they literally gobble glucose. They're literally gobbling up our energy. And so, you know, one of the things that the magic things is many people come to this work to think about how to you know, fix something or solve something with kids, but it's really about, about the adults and, and, and our well-being, and, and we're all stretched so thin. Nobody's yeah. into that parasympathetic and that restorative. Yeah. Um, so I want to just end with asking you, and then I'll, at the very end, I'll ask you to leave any final words that you want to share, but you have sure. to tell this story. You wrote a blog and we'll <laughs> it here. Right. And I think I read it last December. Um, yeah. And I'm a real believer in the power of stories and, and being vulnerable is also a strategy. But if you yeah. feel comfortable telling your, I call them oh so human <laughs> moments about, you know, that's just part of it. Right. But you wrote a story uh, that I, I, it was just, it was really a moving story and yeah. it was the best example I've ever seen or heard of, of how to help a child experience or, or kind of realize what, what, actual pro-social stress is it was a hard one to read yeah no and it was a hard one to live in some in some respects so uh, for anybody who's read the the blog apologies I'll I'll retell the story but I I think it's one of those that as you tell the story you wouldn't you don't see it coming and and I felt like that was what I really wanted to express in the story like so like I'm going um and and I'll tell what I why I wrote the blog and and all that to, uh, with it. But I I'm going to see my son play soccer. My son is I don't know how to capture it in in story, but my son's one of the funnest. Like he he wears his hair to the side, pink hair. Wears like he is him and is unapologetic about just being as cool as can be. And, and he, he's he's hilarious about it. Right. So fun. Um, he's out there, he's playing soccer. He's a really athletic kid. He scored two goals in the game. We're walking out of the, you know, the, the field or the pitch, however you want to call it. We're walking across the parking lot and joking around. And he said he wanted to get like a slushy great run our way. I, I promise you it was one of those moments that you, you know, the weather's perfect, everything that you would want for your, your kid, if they're in sport, like this is the exact experience I would want for them feeling good. 
it's just the two of us, which we don't always get. I love my other son, but he just happened to be out elsewhere at the moment. So we go to this um, convenience store to get the slushy. We're joking around the whole way there. All, nothing but good vibes. The moment of like, if you want a picture, this is why I want to be a father. This is it. We go into the store. My son starts bantering with the clerk. It's really funny. My son wears, um, you know, the number seven on his back, like Cristiano Ronaldo, this amazing soccer player. And for any young person who's li listening, this they'll probably laugh at this part because it's become somewhat of a trend that when someone scores a goal, whether it be from the FIFA soccer game or whatever, that when Ronaldo scores, he jumps and then everybody goes, so like this loud. So my son does that whenever he scores a goal. It's like a big joke. The whole team runs behind him and, and I'm telling the clerk about it. And I said, oh yeah, you should see it. And he does this move. And, and the clerk was having, I mean, nothing but love back and forth, like lots of good joking. And he puts his hand on my shoulder and he says to my son, you know, that's, that's good. Just don't be fat like your dad. And it's this pause, like, wait a minute, what, what was that? I recognize very quickly, this is harmless banter in his mind. You know, like, okay, you can joke with your friends about weight. What he doesn't know is I've got decades of feelings about my body and decades of fighting my own stuff. My son, who's not even a decade old at that point, knows this is my soft spot and looks up at me as if, oh my, why did he say, like, he's just looking at me, what am I going to do? I chuckle and kind of move on and pay and we leave. And my son, when we got outside, he's furious. Why did he do that? And is, and why did you, why did you let him, why did you laugh? He's mad at me now. Why did you laugh? And where did the experience guy walked into this convenience store, the best dad on the planet. This is the greatest thing. And now it's, you know, I could go on for hours about my own, you know, insecurities around, you know, weight and, you know, not doing enough, not eating right and all the different things. Oh, I could have done this. And, it, you know, the story goes on and on. Um, but here I am. It's a snap of a finger. And now the world has shifted and I have to show to my son, what do you do here? And I said, what do you want me to do? You want me to fight with him? Do you? you I don't know him. He He's not... Would he have responded well if I said, hey, that really hurts my feelings? If he was my friend or my brother or some other, um, let's say a male in my life who, who tends to joke that way, or even woman in my, any, any human in my life who decides to joke that way that finds that funny, I can tell them, hey, I don't joke like that. That really hurts my feelings. Just in the future, don't, don't go there. I'm never going to see that guy again. So my son and, and I have a good discussion. I said, but you know what I will do? I will make a shine lesson out of this. You know, I'll bring this back to school. I'll figure out what I'm going to do. And, and I did go back to write something around like, hey, this will go back to pro-social stress. This is a good example. My son's stress and what his level of stress of what is going on with my dad at this moment yeah. and that deep hurt of, well, he just called my dad something that really hurt my dad's feelings. I, I thought was the perfect example of it. And then I thought maybe there may be some layers to um, teaching empathy, you know, yeah. with it in the class. And when I told the story, I had a student in third grade, literally, I, this was why I wrote the blog, his impact of like, Joel, I think I'm going to cry. He raised his hand and he said, I think I'm going to cry when he heard it. I get emotional even thinking about it. He's such a wonderful kid. Um, that's, that is the deepest level of empathy that I've seen from it. And I can explain that feeling that you have right there. It's stressful, but that's empathy. Like you just felt it. And everybody who might be feeling something for me, I'm okay. Like I'm sharing this for a reason. Like I'm comfortable. It's a good clinical use of self at this point to talk this through. And I can tell you that that guy probably has thought less of that experience than he probably has thought of the smoke that may be in the air today, right? Like he, you know, what he's not thinking t anything, sunsets, whatever. But I can tell you that I know that hundreds of people that I taught that lesson to learned empathy. 
And then I was like, well, maybe this could be something that goes beyond where somebody could bring this into their own lesson of how do you teach empathy? Yeah. So let me write. To, and I, I can tell you right now, I am, um, you think I've got insecurities around my body, but insecurity around my writing is, is even worse. So to put something together, <laughs> to put something together and put it in a blog was, was hard. And, and I have never shared this out loud, but I'll share it in this because people are probably Aviva fans on the, this. Aviva is one of my favorite bloggers yeah. and that she commented on the blog was like, Oh my goodness. <laughs> this, this is amazing. Right. Like, and I got such a wonderful response from friends, family and professionals, yeah. professionals I haven't seen in a long time that, yeah. that I would have the courage to put it out. And it wasn't about me. That was all about how can we explain this is stress that people go through. And then my son, I mean, my son, wow. That he, we actually, I got to teach his class that lesson too. And for him to be able to have such power and then to see it get put, he, you know, he did some editing of the of the story and, and like, are you sure this is it? Did I get that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like for him to be part of that was just such a great way to reframe that whole experience. It's really interesting because we try to teach empathy. We try to teach resilience. We try to teach self-regulation. They're all concepts, right? Mm. You know, but it's it's giving an experiencing of, of it and having them notice it, right? And it also speaks to a connection. It was so hard on that child in your class to think about how hard that must have been on you, right? So right. it's just it's such a it's such a good story. And I love that you that you know it wasn't done in vindictive, vindictive. the guy behind the, the teller wasn't trying to be uh, yeah. mean, you know, right? So uh, it, it, it it's a powerful one. Well, we're going to wrap up for today. Anybody that is sparked by this, if you're hearing it before July 4th, um, you can hear Joel speak at our summer self break summer symposium uh, in person, but he's also going to be one of the ones that will be uh, webcast out. So so come and hear his story and what uh, what he has to share and, and what he uh, what he uh, is doing and dreaming and working on in his school, which is uh, lots of very, very cool things. But the final word is yours, Joel. What would you like to leave people with today? Cool. That's a good question. Um, I, I think the big thing is just the the getting to a place of, of trusting some of the things that you guys put together with the, you know, I feel like I love the approach of the three pagers or the under seven minute videos. What it yeah. seems very intentional uh, that this practice can change just about anybody's life. You know, whether you're an administrator, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a therapist, whether you're a parent or uh, not a parent, just a teacher or even a child. How do we teach some of these things? Not necessarily to just get to calm and everything gets better, but just to be able to communicate and and be thoughtful around stuff. I think this is self reg has been so helpful in in all of that. And um, you know, I think when you say there's lots of cool things in the works, I'm looking forward to being able to have this conversation. I see it's June seventh. We're 2023. If we look at June seventh, 2024. Some of the things that are with the irons that are in the fire, I'm really um, looking forward to the year ahead of what the work's going to be. But then to be able to look back and go, okay, that was really good. We did this, 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 and be able to celebrate that again, I think will be um, something I'm really, really looking forward to. Well, thanks, Joel. Where can people find you? Are you on social media? Is there any place they can find you if oh, they're question. interested in connecting? And you can also say no. <laughs> they can't yeah, no I'm resistant to the social media stuff at this point, but I would say, you know, follow stuff that, that, that our school is doing. Our school's social media is really, um, really good. I have a website, um, but it's much more for my private practice when people, someone's trying to connect. Uh, and maybe that's something that I will work on. You know, most of my blog stuff I keep in the professional dom like domain in, in LinkedIn. I usually put stuff there, um, but resistant to the Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at this point. But LinkedIn who knows? Counts. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> They'll just have to come to symposium and hear you. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I know that if I ever write anything, I give it to you guys yeah. to put it up at the self rag stuff. Yeah, which we love. So thank you. That was an interesting conversation. And we'll have to have a mindfulness uh, one, go more di more in depth in that topic that you were so interested in. I would love that. Road. So I think that's worthwhile. Thanks, Joel. Take care. Yep. 
Bye, Take everyone. care.